we five faculty poets are somewhat overwhelmed by the turnout. Um, and thank you all. Um, it's it's uh, heartening, although I'm not sure we need to be heartened at this point in the semester. If you'd all just come back and cheer us on in uh, <laughs> the round Halloween, we probably all could use it. And then we'll cheer you on, and it'll be a mutual thing. Um, so welcome to the fall semester at UC Berkeley. Welcome to the English Department's Mod Five Room on a very hot evening. Um, and welcome to tonight's poetry event, which celebrates the fact that poetry, living poetry, is a uh, presence in, at UC Berkeley and in Berkeley's English Department. Before I introduce the poets, I want just briefly to introduce uh, the co co coordinator of the Holloway Poetry Series, poet and currently a grad student, Charles Legere. Um, Charlie, if you just wave. <laughs> um, I'd also like to direct, I'd like to direct your attention to the display of books uh, that the ASUC bookstore has very kindly brought for you to look at, thumb, and they also are available to purchase if, if you want to do that. Um, there are other readings scheduled for the fall, as I'm sure many of you are aware, um, including one a week from tonight back in this room, that is September 11th, which will feature two important and amazing poets. The first is currently a graduate student at UC Berkeley. Her name is Hilary Gravendike. Many of you know her. Um, she's the author of a chapbook titled The Naturalist, and she is at the very, I would say, like two-thirds of the way through her dissertation, so two parallel accomplishments. That evening will also feature a poet from the UK, a man named Tom Picard, who is a uh, lyric poet of enormous stature and influence in the UK, and also also a North Country balladeer. Um, he is one of the uh, sort of most significant and in many ways most flamboyant of uh, living UK writers. So that's a week from tonight, same time, 6.30. Hopefully it will be cooler. Um, and then other readings follow. You can look at for flyers around the corridors. You can look at the Holloway Poetry website, the address of which I consistently forget. But you can find it because you're all more techno-savvy than I am. Um, the order of uh, events tonight um, will be as follows. Um, there are five poets reading. Lynn Hegidian, John Shoptaw, Jeffrey G. O'Brien, Robert Hass and Cecil Giscom. Um, I'm Lynn Hegenian, the first on the on the task. Um, so I'll introduce myself. Um, on the table is uh, my most recently published book called Situations Sings, and shortly, I mean within a week or so, a second book called Circus Saga um, will be published and um, to a diptych, I think they call it. I don't know why. Situation Sings, Saga Circus. I seem to be in this sibilant mode currently. Um, but be that as it may, um, for the last two years, 10 years, no, last two years, I've also been involved in a 10 author collaborative writing project titled The Grand Piano, an Experiment in Collective Autobiography, San Francisco, 1975 to 1980, um, which is known um, to the very few who even think to know about such things as the heroic period of language writing. Um, it's a memoir of the heroic period um, and named after a coffee house on Haight Street, which is where many of the early language-centered writing readings and uh, readings by poets who were interested in uh, emerging avant-garde experiments took place. I'm on the English Department faculty, um, and I also run two money-losing publishing ventures, um, Tumba Press and A. Telos, both dedicated to publishing avant-garde poetry and cross-genre writing. The second poet to read this evening is John Shoptaw. In the larger literary world, John is perhaps best known as the author of the brilliant 1994 book on the outside 
looking out the poetry of John Ashbery, but he is also a prolific poet with a fastidious and elegant and yet natural sense of prosody, which in his own work is put in the service of narrative, and particularly of something one might term American narrative. Um, I'm thinking more of Whitman and Dickinson than of something hideously conventionese um, in that American there. Um, variously laconic, angry, nostalgic, he writes about ordinary American ordinariness. His most recent work is, however, not a book but an opera about Abraham Lincoln's last night at the Ford Theater, as told by various of the actors and the audience members present on the night of his assassination. Titled Our American Cousin, with music by Eric Sawyer, it received its premiere this last summer in June in a full stage production at the Academy of Music Theater in Northampton, Massachusetts, by the acclaimed Boston Modern Orchestra Project, and some of New England's foremost opera stars were in it. A CD of that opera has just been released. We don't have it here tonight, but if you're interested, Google John Shoptaw, Our American Cousin, and you can buy it online, um, which is what I'm going to do when I go home tonight. Um, the third poet on the uh, bill tonight is Jeffrey G. O'Brien. Jeffrey served as the Holloway poet uh, five, four or five years ago here at Berkeley, um, a distinguished position, as many of you know, whose previous tenants have included Louise Gluck, Frank Bedart, Michael Palmer, Yusef Kumanyaka, Paul Muldoon, among others. His first major book of poetry, The Guns and Flags Project, was published by UC Press in 2002. And the second, The Guns and Flags Project, oh, sorry, the Gray and Green, came out in, is that the title, Jeffrey? Gr gr green and gray, yeah, that's, sorry. Um, cutting and pasting. Um, pasting and cutting. Came out from the same press last year. His third book, 2A, was written in collaboration with the poet Jeff Clark. Um, his writing eschews settled meetings, meanings in favor of ever-changing lyric configurations, in part because of a determination to evade commodified images and to declare poetry as a free zone. In addition to teaching in the English department here, he teaches literature and composition at San Quentin State Prison. Bob Hass, Robert Hass will read forth tonight. Bob's most recent book of poetry, as any of you who listen to NPR or read any newspaper will know, is Time and Materials, which came out last year and won both the 2007 National Book Award and the 2008 Pulitzer Prize. Bob is the principal translator into English of the poetry of the Nobel Prize winning poet Cheslav Milos. He's the author or editor of several volumes of poetry and translation, including the essential haiku versions of Basho, Busan, and Isa, Poet's Choice, The Best American Poetry 2001, 20th Century Pleasures, Prose on Poetry, and it's here and now, right? It, uh, which is a volume here for, for sale. Bob has given much of his time to promoting public ventures for poetry, venues for poetry. One example can be found just down the street from campus along the so-called Berkeley Poetry Walk, which runs along the north and south sides of Addison Street between Shattuck and Martin Luther King Jr. Boulevard in downtown Berkeley. Bob has served as as Poet Laureate of the United States from 1995 to 1997. He is currently working on a book of essays. Cecil Giscom, C.S. Giscom, will read last tonight. Cecil has a new book, Prairie Style, which came out basically today. Um, but the ASUC bookstore, which is, uh, like many things in Berkeley, ahead of its time, actually had copies to bring for sale today. Um, so. Cecil was amazed to see them because he only got his first copies today. Um, so you could get your first copy today, too. Um, on at least one occasion, Cecil has described Prairie Style as, quote, a group of chunky lyrics. That's chunky, not clunky. They are prose poems, and it is by virtue of the way they sit on the page that one might consider them chunks. 
By my count, Prairie Style will be Cecil's seventh book of pro poetry, a long list which includes Giscom Road, which is also on the table, a cross-genre foray into historiography that is simultaneously a work of memory, though not necessarily his own memory, a work of lyric ethnography, a contour map whose contour lines are lines of poetry, and a pastoral meditation. His list of publications also includes Into and Out of Dislocation, a prose account of, among many other things, aspects of the black diaspora into the far north, travels in Canada, and the writing of Giscom Road. Along with Bob Hess and me, work of Cecil's appears in the very recent anthology titled American Hybrid, a Norton anthology of new poetry. When Norton doesn't really want to endorse a book, they don't call it the Norton Anthology of something, but that has the title, and then a, Nor a Norton Anthology of something comes as a subtitle. Um, so uh, just for those of you who are interested in canonicity and semi-canonicity and hybrid canonicity, um, watch for that. Um, work of Cecil's also appears in Lyric Postmodernisms, an anthology of contemporary innovative poetries, and in the forthcoming Black Nature Anthology, the first anthology of Black Nature poems, for which he also provided one of the subject introductions. The subject in question is pests, and it's not about any of you. <laughs> and his essay is addressed to the Bull Weevil song. All right. So we're going to come up in that order, Cecil, John, Jeffrey, Bob, I mean, uh, Lynn, John, <laughs> Jeffrey, Bob, Cecil. Um, and I'm going to begin by reading from this book of collaboration, Situations Sings, just a little bit. Um, it's a collection of some dozen or so collaborations written over uh, 12 years with a poet who lives in Boulder, Colorado, named Jack Collum. At the back of the book is a, an afterword that describes the game rules for each of the collaborations. And I'm not going to bother with explaining them now. Um, but this, this particular poem is from the section called Horizon. Um, well, I'll tell you, the only the rule is um, that we took turns adding words to a pithy and wise aphorism that runs down the left-hand margin. This one reads, horizons lift remaining distances. Um, and the first letter of each of those, no, the letters of each of those words are the first letters of each line. So we had the word and we had to spin off of that line. Otherwise, we could have as many words as we wanted, no rhyme scheme, nothing else. Um, this is called geological time. Have the fingers fallen through the window? Have the ostriches learned to read? Have the red dawns become statistics of their own thievery inhibited by the coursing of the sun? They steal zealously from a minute or two of the tangential opinions of an expert on time who appears on time, not that you ever quite know when. The whiteness shadows the expert who is magenta, then blue. Let's have a party. I'll bleach and darken everyone, infants included, as they emerge into the present to create the present even before we have accepted it from the hands of hallucinogenia and friends thumping the ground, waking up images, thwarting romance, making restitution for their tiny curves of determinism. Exceptional moments, brilliant and radiant, emerge by chance, milliseconds that become minutes, then months in the hum of hindsight, are gathered without collapse. And it is by that hindsight extension, which we know as light, that we know them intimately. Black holes of memory, on the other hand, nestle the night from which dreams fly into simply out. Meanwhile, dense aphotic sticks swim north, drawn by the dark iron that shapes them into skeletal guarantees of the one direction from which all others dissolve, into concealment so profound we term it forgetting. Immediately then, the smallest distinction lights up, becomes a gulf seeded with fissured anti-authoritative ambivalences that will bloom as orchids and ferns. This objective efflorescence will, 
20 years hence dominate the critical landscape abundantly and ambitiously, basking and puddling the horizon, nestling heaviness within its lightness, turning citizens to wanderers without befuddlement, without nationality, free elephant herds whose destructiveness dissolves in yellow yawns of time stilled, time creased, time in layered plenitudes. And then I'm going to read just uh, a couple of the opening pages of a poem in this book called Crisscross. Um, the it's, it's written in, well, you can't see it, in two parallel columns. The left-hand column um, is a uh, very short journalistic entry, and the right-hand column is a uh, five-line poem in, uh, in which we traded stanzas. So you, you wrote a, a dated entry and a five-line stanza, and uh, you, the, 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 there's a certain word pattern and a repeat pattern. So I'm just going to read the dated entries down first and then read the, the linked poem down first. It goes on for like 25 pages. Um, we really like this one. Um, so, But I'm just going to read the first couple of pages. Um, 123, friend Jim's birthday, give him six. He sits a while, then off he goes. 128, dreamed I was a classicist, cold sky. To be one would be to plunge into the misty sea. First discussion with Heike about the Caspar Hauser project, after which I ordered Feuerbach's lost prints. 25, up betimes 5.30, stomach ache. Thought how I longed to see the stars in daytime as I stumbled through this glorious, horrible house. 217. The garden is sodden, but the soil is strong. I note this from the window. February is no poor halfway stage. Sometimes I think I can will seriousness, meaning, and for myself at least, and for a while, I succeed. 224. Almost missed the sunrise. Phew! What would I have to have perpetrated to make up for that? Hope for a big laugh today. I need it. 4-3. M is born, a new life, life didn't miss. In the same part of town, too, it remains available to fire eaters and to quartets of acrobatic kids, human pyramids. 411, phantom pain seems to be diminishing. Just one lively suicide watch, though, and it's down to newspapers for a day. 417, hairless but swollen limbs, I'm flailing in a dream. I feel a strong and enduring ambivalence, thanks to which I'm both able and unable to answer questions put to me. The inquisitor asks, do you believe in dreams? <coughs> and then the poems that are adjacent to that. <coughs> Excuse me. In the beginning, the relational was merely a chickadee's tonic fifth from somewhere out on a twig caused by some consonantal friction in the soup preceding air. The traveler tosses in the soup preceding air, which she takes as proof of everything, but clarity is not served by classifying everything as full of everything. She realizes seeing everything as full of everything is close to seeing seeing as full of realization, or husband full of husband, as false as it's obvious. Something which is as false as it's obvious, like a broken chair, blocks the way, unless it's the mockingbird's raucous jackhammer imitation through which singing sings on. Rhythms run off through which singing sings on top of the jerked gravelly bass, I'm speaking of the glacier, the only local linear crack in brevity's armor. Light on the linear crack in brevity's armor bends in the dark backward of emotion. Everything that is has continuous duration, though the time between limits varies. 
then I think the time between limits varies for a reason. And the reason is simply this, that variation always, always wins by the same token nobody. Is all variation by the same token nobody crossing a roadside ditch some summer day, remembering her life as Pythagoras as ryegrass grows wildly beside a road? And then I'm going to read just a couple of places, a little pieces from an unpublished uh, work, although I've tried to get it published, um, which is the outcome of in that little diary passage had first meeting with Heike Liss about the uh, Kasper Hauser project. Um, this was a collaboration which I did over the next couple of years with a German photographer named Heike Liss. And we just can't find a publisher who wants to publish a book with weird poems and even weirder photographs. Um, for those of you who don't know, Kasper Hauser was a, a child who was found standing at dawn in a, uh, a square by a, uh, in a, a city square in Germany in the early uh, 19th century, 1812, um, who could not speak and uh, had, there was no explanation for him. Um, he was taken into custody by the town doctor, and various scientists inspected him. Um, over the next six years, Kasper Hauser uh, seemed to learn to speak, which is evidence that he had previously known language, because children don't learn language if they haven't been exposed to it by a certain age. Um, and he became a uh, very adept musician, principally a pianist, and an exquisite artist working in drawings. And then when he was 18 years old, he was stabbed. It's almost certain that um, Kasper Hauser was the real prince of, the, of Bavaria, um, and that he had been abducted by his uncle and put, the, the uncle thought he was put to death, but he was hidden in a farmhouse. The uh, underground cellar in the farmhouse was ultimately discovered. Um, anyway, there's a, a fantastic Werner Herzog film, um, which is almost like literally from the, the Feuerbach book, The Lost Prince. Um, if you ever want to check it out, it's really amazing. All right, Heike Liss and I, at the time, were both interested in perceptual distortions. Um, let's call them handicaps. Um, and, and uh, the marvels of perceptual possibility that such so-called handicaps uh, allow one access to. Heike went for uh, 24 days in um, Stuttgart, which is the city that she was living in, um, with uh, earplugs that muffled sound so that she had um, seriously impaired hearing, and uh, her camera, and took a sequence of over the 24 hours of uh, photographs that you can't really see what you're seeing. Uh, I mean, you see something, but you can't always know what it is. Um, so they're patterns of black and light, and they're really great. And so I'm just going to read a, a tiny bit of the poetry that I wrote in parallel with the photographs. I don't like to be reprimanded. Nothing necessarily follows. Rain mumbles, perhaps in mockery, perhaps in worship. I pinch at the rain, fail to seize its downfall, pinch at soil, fail to secure a place. Humans are constantly trying to pick up where something left off. This morning I went out walking, then down came chiming rain. I saw what I thought was a sailor, but then saw that it was a motorcycle. Then the sun came out, and what I thought was a little tree in the distance turned out to be a mongrel only a few feet away and wanting to play with me. Extreme confusion. Instinct is one thing, into an intuition another, feeling a third. I jump when the doorbell rings, know a chair for what it is, revel at the close of day. Wherever I go, I do feel a third. Gravel is very pale, cattle mumble. When one breathes, one is stitching in a hollow. What I mean is that one learns things in clusters. The stars are lost in light and then lost in sleep, and the horses are lost in a windowless pit and then found in a dark wood. They wobble midway, 
graze over gravel, stumble. Childhood was my exile. Yet one does not say of a child that he or she is in exile. When I watch things, they falsify. They pretend to stop and live forever. I'm fooled. I don't pretend otherwise. Sometimes I'm watched, too. Something having been done, something more is sure to occur, something at some time. A rumpled crystal, someone's striving, a painting of something that goes by in a hurry. I dream, and along comes a man on a horse. The saddle is latching. The two are restless, blank, and I hear them when they aren't there. Contemporary life has brought us all an incredible number of things. They come from everywhere. I was tempted to bring something home from the market and chose, after much consideration, a peach. But when I seized it, it fell, and I thought it was screaming, because, as usual, I misunderstood. But I cannot believe that the life one leads consists of nothing but meaningless captures. Thank you. And now, John Shopra. Lynn, thank you, uh, and Charlie, thanks for putting this together tonight. I really appreciate it. Happy to be here. I, I have Casper Hauser in my mind, and I'm trying to shake it. Um, I'm going to begin tonight with a uh, short translation of uh, a poem a uh, hymn to Apollo, the end of this uh, poem by uh, Climacus, a Hellenistic poet of the third century BCE. It's called Down River from Climacus. Envy whispered slyly in Apollo's ear. I don't think much of the singer whose songs don't outnumber the seas. Apollo showed envy his foot and this figure. Great is the sweep of the Euphrates, but a great deal of muddy silt and heaps of verbiage does it sweep. Slim bees don't bear water to their meadow queen from just anywhere, but from the secret spring that seeps clean and clear little trickle, prize string. Welcome, Apollo, but you blame. Over there, where envy backs up, get going. Envy trickled shyly into Apollo's ear. I don't admire the poet whose poems mirror the seas. Apollo shoved envy with his foot and this parable. Mighty is the flood of the Mississippi. Tons of earthy silt and loads of salvage do its cross currents carry. From nowhere do the debutantes fetch water for their queen, but the very latest spring, which creeps up flavorless and pure, tiny font, topmost fizz. Oh, hello, Apollo. But, crew of Momus, down where envy parades, you go too. In, in the pipeline. Not for nothing, on an island in the mill pond's fibrous scum, oxbow dammed off Little River, ancient channel in her prime 
of the roving Mississippi. Day and night, the pump house ran. Chugging by itself in place, it cycled on and off and on, grew a pipeline, sent it slinking length by length on up the bank, out to Himmelberger Lumber, where a mill hand, name of Hank, from a barrow that he wheeled about the night shift in a dream, fed it scraps of wood, chips, sawdust, brung out water to a steam. Branching off in pipes and fittings, elbows, crosses, nipples, tees, it built a mill town out of steam heat, made its whistle hoot and wheeze. Single-minded shoot, asbestos sleeved and piping hot, you crept up the back wall of the mill house where I, eight then, overslept, coupled with our radiator, eddied through its silver coils, clank hissed, what I think I make out only now, thank this, thank this. Home of the Throat Roll. This is the motto of Lambert's Cafe, where I'm from, where, yes, rolls are throwed. As with the curvaceous, flood-prone river, squeezed into skin-tight levees, its meandering wrongdoings riven by fringeless cutoffs, its maladroit course bypassed with an unending, unbending spillway or outlet, so with the river road, swerving and plunging with no outlet, a sluggish blacktop dotted with purple hull peas signs, stoplighted riverfront downtowns, left in the wrong by the streamlined interstate, which abandoned that malformed back road to run off with the glitzy outlet mall. For the discounted and irregular customer, an outlet for stylish expression. As with the river road, so with the river town, wrung out to dry by its own inhabitants, shown to be hootably wrong on the TV network's tongue. Hee-haw! As goes the malodorous river otter that back floated once without let in otter slough, prying apart the river mussel on its stomach, so goes the river town's drowsing daughter who can do no wrong, flipping open on her brown belly, fresh from the mall, her first cell, fully charged at a surge-protected outlet. And this is a cup of water I'm taking a drink from. And this is, oh well, a group of poems. The nut don't fall very far from the tree. Not very far, leastways, not far enough. I told you, you can't go back there. Seems like everybody in Little River who works in Little River works for the police, rhymes with holy of holies. Every place a premises. Can't take no snapshot of that slab away with you on your phone. You think I like telling you this? You can't come in, your sister tells me. Why not? We go upstairs. Your mom is wiping the stove, weeping and wiping. You are out on your bed in the kitchen area. You remember your bed. He fell, your sister says. My mom brings you too. 
you have what is called a slight concussion. Evidently, since this memory of mine has yet to come to. This swamp won't last the century, the lumber company thinks, and so it sinks an oil hole that sinks till it strikes water and pipes up the splashy tune it has played ever since. So my dirty JPEG tells me from half a century back. Let go after 29 year. The mill changing hands, relocating him, handing him his two weeks pay. Take it easy. No retirement, not even tired. Jackie Hayes takes up police work like his son before him. And only some time after, so slow he hadn't taken note, finds he's let it go like wood kiln smoke from off his tongue. Three axes marked a spot. One, a little river running south. One, an iron mountain line due west. One, a mineral water spout straight up. And one, remarking them, held three axes in her hands, one in her hour, one her minute, and one her second hand. The first she planted in the stream, diverting it. The second struck the railway line, untying it. The third blade placed atop the spout, put a stop to it. Her hands Free now, she winds the stem of her watch. The mill whistle wakes me in the dark the morning after graduation. I know I'm dreaming. I also know I'm going to work at the mill. The well's still there, I just can't see it. It's like the very place is a blind spot. I cup my hands anyway, thinking, the water I no longer taste will do me good. They what? They capped it, blocked it off. You think they'd have kept it? But nothing like that ever happens in Artesia, where Dame Aquifer, far below her freesia, glides among her pebbles. Collective amnesia was going around, those company people saw no point to it. Oh, well, she is said to have sighed as her water table went dark. But why? Why the hell not? It was their mixer, their mill. They rolled its gravel drum, swung its chute, her and her elixir her abstracted gesture. The concrete swept down her throat. That'll fix her. Not 0.7 naught, nine grains quartz, 12 point nada nada milk grain sulfate, 0 0.077 de-icer, 20.4055 grains flare, 69.936 grain salt, not point diddle diddle, not diddle squat. But there was a time too, Dame Aquifer, when we up here built you a pool, round and stone lined, remember? Where you fountained up and flattened out into a pedestal table, a cypress more like, stark bald, or egret plumed, us cropping up around you, your buttressing cypress knees. You wave us over for a word with you. Truth be told, we meant nothing, mattered less 
to each other. What happened then really made no difference to any of us. Well, madam, we don't know about you, but we do recollect this jug, a gallon glass, ring-handled, Coke syrup jug. One old character, in his sweat-darkened slop hat, would clunk along half a dozen in a toy wagon, its rusted handle lengthened with jump rope. But mostly, bonneted women in their ankle-length dresses, and one or more of their bonneted daughters in their ankle-length dresses, would cradle a jug apiece, emptied, rinsed out, gingham stoppered. They looked to the rest of us like congregants of some backwoods religious order. Sure, but the very same rest of us would meet upstairs after hours, up where we could look over you, from our second-story lodge, where our worshipful master handed out his secret handshake, and plump goddesses of the eastern star uncovered their cloth-covered dishes. You looked ambery, tasted salty, smelled of rotten egg, but we all believed you had properties. You were something to people who came and stood around you. People was, as my Aunt Juanita used to say, people was interested. It was understood. Thank you. Thank you, John. And thank you to the poly hatted organizers. I shouldn't talk about hats this week, actually. What, you know what I'm talking about? We have to take off our Republican hats and put on our American hats. McCain said. That's not me. Um, my glossing mechanism is on the fritz because of the heat, so I'm just going to quickly read four svelte poems I wrung from the summer. Um, Vague cadence. And a way of practice, the other is. Like a river out of acts, the other is. Hapless, unheard, with marks upon him. Having dallied in tarrying unwisely, backlit at an undecidable remove. In a house of marks, the other is useless deciding whether to leave or wait in best practices like a child. A hapless river filled with sand. For years it flows like wet clock rope. Years of saying as it moves away are this undecided water the other brings. Like the child of acts, the other is. Saying to himself, the other is. A hapless river practicing its flow. A house that moves to where one was. With all years off, the water still goes. The lights are on, so the dark is out. Like the useless child, the other is a certain building dream, then a part of speech without a name. Okay, tiny glass. This was written in a fit of pique about people taking pictures of themselves next to Van Gogh paintings in the Met this summer. <laughs> I guess fit of pique motivates gloss more than anything else. Um, it's called The Other Arts. It was in the Renaissance wing. That's not part of the poem. The other arts. I laughed at how the donor was. My friend preferred the laborers at rest. It was at or about the middle of a day, pouring in through concrete and glass to make a second museum appear. The young girl caught between them, painted silent under linden trees. I talked about the wheat and clothes designed to shield workers from sun. He said all style was still to be found in the subject's dominant hand or ear. In tall white rooms, some people moved like the opposite of paintings. Hope without details, they moved, then paused to take a picture with their phones, stopping as much to listen as look at said things, if things could be said. The frequency of donkey and cow 
donor and victim still at their prayers. Rhythm's embarrassment appears on their face, a silent apology for moving at all. Like liquid stone, the face still moves in and out of famous colonnades, where I laughed and was responded to with remarks on impossible perspective, all the life in some of the folds, which is like thinking everything is foreground of the background, the expense of the materials shining forth from three key places on a diagonal barely visible in the broken lines of her cloak. He observed of clouds they represent what else could have happened, a gallery without its pictures, workers' thoughts in half-worked fields they leave across both realms. Forms of Battle, which is a really trivial citation of a part of uh, Paradise Regained. There's something about the open fate, all ills flower from, smoke and rain you can shoot the future through, that reminds me of a fallen sound, less song than circular hum, defining the monotony of acts, soldiering on half a world away. If sound had a face, it would be blown apart immediately. But there would be many things about it left over to flower, almost an infinite veil by now. I had a friend who heard things in it, sole protection against dangers. And so I made my way across the facial terrain to be with her, balancing the head on its act of white noise, both fun and ugly. But there we were, walking the trail, designed to reverse bad thoughts by crossing itself at several points. Unclear anything happened after, except the way we composed, a stay thrown back against the room, lights ashamed to be on and on. Nothing left but the bitter verbs of manner of motion away from a source, the pastoral jail of refrain. And so I put my head under her arm as though to leave America. Um, I apologize to Lynn and to all the rest of you as well. A few commodities got into this poem, but not into the title. White of the Eyes. That there are synonyms for things. Winter, spring, if at a distance. And that these things can be sold. Earpiece, track lights, cable, tones. That the joy of bad times is equivalent words. Those set up to make a chain into clouds. As many as let moments through. Monday, weekends, November, noon that seasons bring equivalent joys, the things to be sold in the stores. More words for things than things, more the night inside them than the one set up outside. That the pleasure of bad times is to hear chain in change, see thing in night when it comes, rearranged as cloud then clouds, that one linked by time to those, while these others seem to hold. The joy of bad times equivalent to a pleasure fallen as things. Like a joy at a distance, winter follows if it does. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you all for coming. It's wonderful to be in this company. I wanted to mention the other fall reading series, Lunch Poems, this fall is going to have um, two younger poets, um, Ilya Kaminsky, who was born in Russia, moved here when he was eight, um, is deaf, writes about mythologies of silence, is an attorney, and won three different first book awards for his first book, Dancing in Odessa, will be reading in October. In December, Tracy K. Smith from Harvard Columbia Writing Program and a Stegner Fellow at Stanford who won the Cave Canem Award for her first book, The Body's Question, and has a second book out called Duende. So those are two noontime readings. And the third of special interest to this community is that 
in November, first Thursday in November, Robin Blazer is going to be here to read. Um, before the Beat Generation and before the San Francisco Renaissance, there was the Berkeley Renaissance, which consisted of three young poets who were classmates at the university, Robert Duncan, Jack Spicer, and Robin Blazer. And toward the end of their time there, a young poet named Gary Snyder had started doing graduate work in East Asian studies, and a young escapee from Columbia University uh, was starting in the English department, Allen Ginsberg, and working as a busboy at Robbie's, and the five of them got together to talk about poetry. Robin Blazer left that crew and moved to Simon Fraser University in Vancouver, where he fathered four generations of experimental writing in Canada. He's now in his 80s. His collected poems and his collected prose have just been published by University of California Press. And he's going to come back to Berkeley and read on Thursday and on Wednesday night before. We'll try to have an event here in which we just invite him to talk about what it was like in those years when this community that exists now got started because of those writers. So, uh, I, I'm also going to read um, <laughs> Three Blind Mice, uh, sketchy and provisional summer poems. This is called From a July Notebook because that's what it is. Everyone comes from a long way off is the first line of a poem I read last night. Two old friends on a long midsummer drive. In the heat haze, they talk and talk. His story is sad and hers is roiled, troubled. The receptionist at the hospital told him to call the city medical examiner's office, but you only got a recorded voice on weekends. It is good to sit down to birthday cake with children who think it is the entire point of life and who therefore respect each detail of the ceremony. There ought to be a rule based on a game for who gets to lick the knife that cuts the cake, and that rule should have its pattern somewhere in the winter stars. Which do you add to the tea first, he'd asked, the sugar or the milk? And the child said, instantly, the milk. Laws as cool and angular as words, angular, sidereal. They are built like exclamation points, woodpeckers. I remember it was raining, a silvery rain, when I first saw it, redheaded, scuttling up a bay tree. Lamartine said it's much easier to describe a bird than a feeling. And David said it was impossible to describe pain. It was no good even trying to tell what had happened that day. Everything he said, he said, seemed fictional the moment he said it. The rain, the bird, what she had said to him when she was leaving, and why it was important to him that the car had been parked on a hillside, and what the patterns were, velvety or blurred, that the rain made on the windshield. What he wanted to say was that when she had said what she had to say to him, she closed the door so firmly and so quietly, the beads of rain on the side window didn't even quiver. A man meets an old girlfriend in a gallery, and she looks beautiful and looks her age, too. She'd had a go at putting herself together, she noticed. She had always had the confidence that with a face like hers, a few touches to represent the idea of a put-together look would do. She had some set designer's genius minimalism, and it gave her a slightly harridan look, and he remembered that it wasn't what was headlong and slapdash about her, but the way that gestured like a quotation toward an understanding of elegance, it would have been boring to spell out that had first attracted him to her. 
He felt his penis stirring at this recognition at a certain memory that attended it and then laughed at the thought that he had stimulated himself sexually with his analysis of her style. And she said, as if remembering the way he could make her insecure, what? What are you smiling about? And he said, nothing. And she said, oh, yeah, I remember nothing. <laughs> so um, this next piece is called Bicycle River Peony. The title comes from a, a phrase in C.D. Wright's American Primer. She says, Everybody knows what poems are made out of. They're made out of words, bicycle, river, peony. She goes on to say, but nobody really knows what words are made out of. I woke up thinking uh, uh, about my brother's body, and when I recorded that line, it contained two typos. So the first dignity, it turns out, is to get the spelling right. I woke up thinking about my brother's body. Apparently, it's at the medical examiner's morgue. I found myself wondering whether he was naked yet and whose job it was to take the clothes off and when they did it. It seemed unnecessary to undress the body when they performed the exam, and that was not going to happen until later this morning. So I found myself hoping that he was dressed still, though smell may be an issue, or hygiene. When the police do a forced entry for the purpose of a welfare check and the deceased person is alone, the body goes to the medical examiner's morgue in the section for those deaths in which there is no evidence of foul play. So the examination for cause of death is fairly routine. He was lying on his back, according to Angela, my brother's friend, who lives in the building and is schizophrenic and always introduced herself as my brother's personal assistant. And he seemed peaceful. There would have been nothing in the room but the mattress and a microwave, an ashtray, I suppose, cartons and food wrappers he hadn't thrown away, and the little plastic subscription bottles that he referred to as his scripts. They must have called the medical examiner's ambulance, and that was probably a team of three. When I woke, I visualized this narrative and thought it would be, sh I visualized this narrative that I'm giving to you now and thought it would be shorter. I thought that what would represent my feelings would be the absence of metaphor. But then, at the third line, I discovered that this could be a three-line stanza and that that would be the second dignity. So I imagine he is in one of those aluminum cubicles I've seen in the movies, dressed or not. I also imagine that if they undressed him and perhaps washed his body or gave it an alcohol rub to disinfect it, that that was the job of some immigrant from a hot, poor country to whom I felt grateful. Anyway, he is dressed in this stanza which mimics the terzarima of Dante's comedy and is a form Wallace Stevens liked to use, and also my friend Robert, and anyway, seemed peaceful, is a metaphor. And this is a sudden and grateful memory of Mississippi John Hurt. Because I woke again thinking of his body and why anyone would care in some future that poetry addresses how a body is transferred from the medical examiner's office, which is organized by local government and issues a certificate certifying that the person in question is in fact dead and names the cause or causes, to the mortuary or cremation society, most of which are privately owned businesses and are run for profit and until recently tended to be family businesses businesses, with skills and decorums passed from father to son and often quite ethnically specific in a country like ours made from crossers of borders, as if in the intimacy of death some tribal sense of shame or squeamishness or decorum asserted itself so that the Irish buried the Irish and the Italians the Italians. In the South, 
In the early years of the last century, it was the one business in which a black person could grow wealthy and pass on a trade and a modicum of independence to his children. I know this because Judith wrote an essay about it and interviewed fourth-generation African-American morticians in Oakland whose grandfathers and great-grandfathers had buried the dead in cotton towns on the Delta or along the Brazos River in Texas, passing on to their children who had gone west an order of doing things and symbolic forms of courtesy for the bereaved and sequences of behavior at wakes and funerals so that, for example, the eldest woman in the maternal line entered the chapel first and what prayers were said and in what order. During Prohibition, they even sold the white lightning to the men who were allowed to slip outside and take a nip and talk about the dead while the cries and gospel song voiced contralto moans of grief that could sound like curious elation rose inside. Also, the rules for burial or burning, griefs and rituals, and inside them, cosmologies. And I thought, gratefully, of Mississippi John Hurt's song about Lewis Collins and its terrible tenderness, which can't be reproduced here because so much of it is in the picking of the 12-string guitar and his sweet, reedy, old man's voice. And when they heard that Lewis was dead... All the women dressed in red, the angels laid him away. They laid him six feet under the clay. The angels laid him away. And this is um, two modes of grief. You can fall a long way in sunlight. You can fall a long way in rain. The ones who didn't take the old white horse take the evening train. In the city of the dead, only the arborist in the park never comes to the great square to gape at new arrivals. He is not incurious, but he loves his work pruning the trees, giving them their graceful lift toward light and standing back to study their shapes. He loves his work because, of course, it is he who gets to decide which limbs are lopped off in the city of the dead. You can fall a long way in sunlight. You can fall a long way in rain. The ones who don't take the old white horse take the evening train. Thursday. Today, his body is consigned to the flames, and I begin to understand why people would want to carry a body to the river's edge and build a platform of wood and burn it in the wind and scatter the ashes in the river, as if to say, take him fire, take him air, and river, take him downstream, downstream. Watch the ashes disappear in the fast water or in a small flaring of anger, turn away, walk back toward the markets and the hum of life, not quite saying to yourself, there, the hell with it, it's done. I said to him once when he'd gotten into some scrape or other, you know, you have the impulse control of a ferret. And he said, yeah, I don't know what a ferret is, but I get greedy. I don't mean to, but I get greedy. Old grubber's beard going gray, a wheelchair, sweats, a street person's baseball cap. I've been thinking, he said, about Billie Holiday. You know, if she were around now, she'd be nothing. You know what I mean? Hip-hop? Never. She had to be born at a time when they were writing the kinds of songs and people were listening to the kinds of songs. She was great at singing. And I would say, you just got evicted from your apartment, you can't walk, and you have no money, so I don't want to talk to you about Billie Holiday right now, okay? And he would say, you know, I'm like mom. I mean, she really had a genius for denial, don't you think? And the thing is, you know, she was a pretty happy person. And I would say she was not a happy person. She was panicky. She was crippled by guilt from her drinking. She was hollowed out by it. And she was evasive to herself about herself. And so she couldn't actually connect with anybody. And her only defense was to be chronically cheerful. And he would say, worse things than cheerful. 
Well, I am through with those arguments, except in my head. So long, little brother. We won't analyze any more the sentimentality implicit in a term like that, and I am through. I thought this poem would end downriver, downriver, worrying about where you are and how you're doing. Oh, thanks. Good evening. Uh, my thanks also to all of you for, for coming. I'm the last reader. Uh, com thanks to all of you for coming to see us. I'm, I'm, I'm very pleased at, the, uh, at all, the, all the faces, all the people in this room, happy that some of my students are here, Ms. Medina, Mr. Yurchikov, uh, Ms. D. Robertus Thai, some others. Um, I've been away all summer, and I'm glad, very glad to be back. I'm going to read to you from, uh, from two projects, from an in-progress book called Railroad Sense and from, uh, and from this book, uh, Prairie Style, which arrived actually yesterday in my mailbox. Uh, the first thing I'll read is from Railroad Sense, <clears throat> which is a book about being in between. It's a book about, about conveyance, transit, buses, trains, etc. This piece is itself a fragment from a longer piece called Roll Signs. A roll sign, or, um, or bus blind, is the placard on the front of the bus or subway that announces the destination. Traveling in public on surface transportation is the situation I came to again and again the way of going for everyone, including people without means. The travel's pretty ordinary, getting from A to B and back, but it gets interesting when you mix in the presence of others there to do something ordinary with you, in spite of you, alongside you. A stranger in blood with whom to share a seat, even if he or she doesn't appear until after you vacate the conveyance. Negotiations. Abandon on the bus, the geography of seating itself, the density of the standees among one's fellow travelers, and perhaps most disconcerting, everybody's similarity. All stalks are the same. Banal transit, in transit, transitory, transitional, the transit mulata blog. Stories of race, gender, and sexuality in public transportation and pluricultural perspective. That's transitmulata.blogspot.com. The several roads that go to make up the Trans-Canada Highway. MARTA, for the Metropolitan Atlanta Rapid Transit Authority. But folks in Atlanta say it means moving Africans rapidly through Atlanta. <laughs> the crypto-racial of bus and light rail where we're going with, where we're going and with whom. The erotically charged space of the omnibus, says the abstract. Mundane travel, rapid transit. My current newish relation to Bay Area rapid transit. Its stations, their mix of outside and inside being the closest thing to the old world I've seen in America. City transit. I grew up in a black and white town, Dayton, Ohio, with a very fine citywide system of electric buses that is largely undiminished now, 40 years after I left home. The west side is still Black Dayton, and the west side buses are number nine, Cincinnati Street, number eight, Lakeview, Nicholas Road, number four, Delphus, number two, Home Avenue, and number one, Drexel. But these are crosstown buses, the roll signs, route number and street, announce the destinations, directions, and the roll signs are changeable. The driver, the driver cranks them, and this was, this was and has been the vision. The driver standing up inside the bus, 
reaching up to turn the handle above the big windshield, changing the destination, going through two or three or several possibilities. Nowadays, road signs are electric, a display of lights that spells it out. Before, they were linen, replaced by treated paper, replaced by the DuPont product, Tyvek. The opposite was present, is present. The black number nine Cincinnati Street bus became the number nine Valley Street, became the number nine Valley Street bus, bound for the Polish neighborhood on the northeast side of Dayton. The number one bus, Drexel, my bus, turned around and became the number one Third Street bus out to the white areas near the Air Force Base, out to where East Third Street becomes Airway Road and later Colonel Glenn Highway. Same bus and driver, different colors of folks in the seats, and the bus bearing the name of the different neighborhood like a flag through the streets of this one. This is the relationship, the indication of you. I never, never want to stop with the idea of this place or that neighborhood being some dichotomy. What I haunt from my seat two or three rows behind the driver is unstable. What I love most is not descriptive prowess, not only crossing the tenets of some static landscape or map, some Dayton, some region. Nor is the bus the figure of transparency. The roll signs are racial, ethnic, class specific. Roll signs contradict. Roll signs hide. Wires all over town, over the big streets, over the boulevards. The bus is, for now, how I say. The bus goes without saying. And I'll read you. Uh, uh, this is this this is uh, the new book that came out yesterday, um, Prairie Style. Uh, I'll gloss a little bit. Um, I'll read the back of the book. Prairie Style <laughs> is about the breakdown of location and voice. It presents a landscape of habitations. Frank Lloyd Wright's designs for servantless families, fox dens in an embankment, the two-mile-long face of Chicago's Robert Taylor public housing project, etc., and crosses and recrosses the border between poetry and prose. Prairie style is the turn inland. Inland, one needs something more racial, say, bigger than mountains. I'm going to read you uh, part one, uh, about five poems, I think, that, and it was the part that was finished, uh, five short poems, the part that was finished, uh, finished last, earlier this year. It starts with, uh, it's, a, it's a section called, uh, uh, called, called Nameless, and it, it, it begins with this, this lovely photograph from, um, from, from Catherine Wright's series of, uh, uh, of photographs called Wrong Sky. This is nameless. Downstate. To have the same sound, to be called by the same name. Locations, what you come to. It's the low point, it usually repeats. To me, any value is a location to be reckoned with. I would be remiss if I didn't acknowledge how an event could be talked about, like it was you or me being talked about. Or locations, the reply the obvious statement about origin. It goes without saying that pleasure is formidable. Vernacular examples. You can always say what you are. Half the time the allegory is music, how song goes with its cornets and saxophones. Do you have something to say to me? Closure regathers the shape of the original undoing, the place where memory changed or picked up. Or it's human-looking, big-boned, almost as noisy, parts missing or left out, parts overstated, a loud brother to the divine, an admonishment. I was two men. I was something. I was something monstrous. Jokes just drain the spirit. I-70 between Dayton and East St. Louis, westbound lanes. I'd essay. I'd go toe-to-toe. -to -toe. Property's a measure of elimination. Down to the left is Little Egypt. Way off to the right, Prairie Duchenne. 
and the Robert Taylor homes of recent memory. You can work for someone. You can be lazy in the face of accident hovering in the wings. Anyone can measure the advent of minor harmonies and melancholy. An arch at Ohio, Indiana. Another similar at the Mississippi. Eaton, Richmond, big Indianapolis. Beautiful sounding Terry Hoot. Don't forget Effingham. Can't forget Effingham. Cry me a river. Generally, value exists in relation to opportunities for exchange, seeing something in terms of something else. But for the sake of argument, say that the shape of region or let me start again. Okay, I blew that one. Cry me a river. Generally, value exists in relation to opportunities for exchange, seeing something in terms of something else. But for the sake of argument, say that the shape of a region or of some distinct area of a city could stand in for memory, and that it, the shape, is a specific value because it's apparent and public, and that way achieves an almost nameless contour. Palaver. Neighborhood? Proximities change on you sooner or later. There's a level of artlessness. My luck has changed more than one time. Love could be an embankment, even an esker, or customs, or a sailing ship noisy at the horizon. The idea was that the wind would carry your voice from here to there, from one side of the field to the other. I was always leaving a place at the point where I'd begun to care for it. This was the gain of singing. The devil's hungry in a song. The devil is sweet. How do I look? Neighborhood's a little fishtail in the substances. And I'm going to read one, one poem from the back of the, the, back of the book. Um, from the notes on region section. Called Very Far, a poem uh, that uh, uh, has a dedication for M. It is Very Far. Uh, coming back, coming back on 150 from the movies in Urbana, and there a healthy fox was in the high beams. A trick for the eyes. How the snout and ears bobbed upward for a moment, his big head thrown back, pale but fast. What doesn't change? What's the central disappointment? That it, the long evening, was a single place? But I always see animals when I travel. Birds, too. Dusk to dawn, Mr. Fox is out on night patrol. There's little surprising about a location. I'd say Mr. Fox can match or resist the prairie with equal success. Thanks very much. Again, thanks to all of you for coming. Thanks to you that stood up for the whole thing so politely. Um, do check out the books um, and have a nice cooling out session outdoors. Good night. <laughs>